URL. Thanks, John. I'm going to do this off screen. Okay. Just to make this more complicated, I broke my glasses this week. So do you know what it's like with broken glasses, a microphone, and a mask? <laughs> so I don't even know what to say anymore. I know. It just, if that is a, would be my only problem, wouldn't it be great? So let's talk about do-overs this week. Isn't that a big fantasy of ours? Do-overs. In fact, you believe in magic when it comes to do-overs. Uh, we believe in magic at my house every uh, week on Wednesdays because that's when the garbage truck comes around. And it's magic. You put everything on the street and everything that you don't want just disappears. Isn't that great? And as many of you know, we recently moved, and of course you seem to generate more things that you magically want to disappear. And of course we did the things that we were responsibly supposed to do. We donated some things, gave away some things. But it is so satisfying to finally just roll the stuff out on Wednesday, on Magic Day. And it's gone. About three weeks ago, we got a new dishwasher. And for $25, we got more magic. He took it away, the old one away. And he would do, he said he was going to do the responsible thing and bring it to Ohio Gulch. And, but you know, that dishwasher exists someplace. I'm not convinced that they took it apart and got all the metal and put it over here and did all the recyclable parts over there. I'd like to think that happened for my $25, but maybe not. But it's magic. We don't have to worry about it. It's a do-over at our house because we moved. So, like I said, we're going to talk about do-overs, or the fantasy of do-overs today. I mean, doesn't that just sound wonderful? We're going to do over Tear down a house and build a new one. We're, we don't like the people we live around anymore. Let's move to a new city. I don't like the people I work for. Let's get a new job. And we go in just thinking, it's just like turning the page, and newness will be everywhere. Healing has it's all over the place. Healing has broke out, and it, none of the issues that, that took place before exist anymore. That's the do-over fantasy, isn't it? Well, I think we are in the age of longing for do-overs and suspecting that it's not quite that easy. In fact, I wrote a little bit about in my blog this week about what I think from the Old Testament is the ultimate do-over attempt. And it's funny, I never, as a minister, gave this story much thought. And as I did this week, it's really kind of perverse, actually. Um, Noah's Ark. I mean, think about it. So you see little children's Bible story books with cartoons and animals going up the ramp and how great it was. And I remember in, um, in first grade, um, Sister Mary Francine glee, a little too gleefully told the story when you really know what it's about. Uh, yeah, all the nuns in my grade school, they're kind of like hip 60s kind of nuns, except for my first grade sister Mary Francine. She was kind of like old school. Um, so she was very gleeful about the flood. And even as a six-year-old, I thought, you know, there's something really kind of sick about this. Um, but anyways, for those that weren't raised with this story, I have to, let's give a quick crypt notes of this. So. And also, when I read the story for the first time in years in the Old Testament in, Ge in Genesis, just seeing how they presented the main character, meaning God. God is a, God in the Old Testament is kind of like the old guy in your street that yells at kids to get off the lawn. <laughs> no, really. And, and really kind of like, oh, go, go away, go somewhere else. And so, kind of opens up the story. He's just not happy. Nobody's doing what he told them to do. Started off with the Garden of Eden, and that didn't work out well. And all these things are, it's just, we need a do-over. I know, let's just drown everybody. <laughs> and again, I'm in first grade with Sister Mary Francine going, what? I want to go back to kindergarten where we did like hand paints and stuff. I don't want to talk, and actually, she, uh, I digress. But not the cartoon version. She showed us pictures, really graphic, of like people at mountaintops grasping for the, for, for the boulders that they're about to go under. And again, as a six-year-old, I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, so where was I in this story? People drowning. But they said, wait, 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 I, okay. There's got to be somebody good around here. Oh, Noah and his family. So let's save Noah, plus some animals, drowned everybody else. So, 
course you know, they build the ark, and all the animals come up. I'm giving you the short version of this. And, of course, when the flood's all over, the waters recede, open the ark. Can't imagine what that ark smelt like after a few days. But, um, and then, of course, we start anew. The big do-over. We've got the best animals, the best family, and everything's going to be great. And again, Sister Mary Francine was again gleeful saying, this is where rainbows came from because that's when God promised to never kill everybody again. Um, and again, as a kid, I thought, no. Oh. Um, but as I'm reading this story a little bit differently, a couple things came to my mind. First of all, I know, I believe that there are some stories throughout scriptures that have some historical basis. I don't think this one does. I mean, I don't think there's anything historically that happened. I think there are lessons to learn here. I'm not sure what the intended lesson was. But here's the first one. Um, so God said, I'm never going to do this again. I think he even said, you know, I may have gone a little too far on this one. <laughs> I think we, as human beings, in our anxiousness for a do-over, sometimes we try it out, and I think we go too far. Go, oh, well, it really didn't work out, did it? I had this fantasy, and it didn't. And the ultimate lesson was here, how well did it end up working out for him? So just go ahead a few more pages in the Old Testament, and everybody's back on earth after the same old things they were before. So like nothing, nobody learned a lesson. Nobody said, you know, the floods could come again. I said, nah, let's just move on. So this is, I think, such a great lesson for our times. We want do-overs. We think if we just get rid of certain things and even certain people, it'll be great. All our worries will be over. Just put them behind us. Put them in a pool. Um, and it'll be great. But we know from the story that the world recreated itself in a s exactly the way that it was before because what needed to be dealt with hadn't been dealt with. That we have this fantasy of renewal without doing the work. And that's what, you know, that's the part that we don't like so much. We want to make a quick escape. We want, like, t today, it's, it's so great. Like every, I'm sure you hear a lot about ghosting friends and boyfriends and girlfriends, meaning you just stop talking to them. You block, you block their, their texts coming in. Doesn't that almost, in a perverse way, sound very satisfying? I don't like you anymore. Click. I will never talk to you again. I mean, it's, just, it's really kind of weird just thinking that you're going to walk away from whatever that situation and never have it repeat itself in your life again. But it's, it's a great fantasy, the great do-over. Just get rid of that that we don't like. And so turn on the TV for 10 minutes today, and you'll see lots of things you think, if we just got rid of that, everything would be really great. So many people from different opinions telling me, if you'd only follow my ideas, everything would be great. Don't worry about those other people who have different ideas than me. I have the right idea. And something tells me, especially now that I've read the Noah story again, that that has a way of not working out that well. And that the way that this universe is set up and engineered is that I don't think there is an escape plan option built in. I think that we have to, in a sense, finally face whatever it is that's uncomfortable or unhealed in some way, and that, as I wrote on my blog this week, you can't walk around, you have to walk through. And I know we don't like to walk through. In fact, I would really like to walk around a lot of things. But I always know that even at times that I just want to avoid it, I have to make the phone call, make the meeting, say what's happening and let's talk about it. And I, you know, don't you hate doing that? I do. But I have found that the only way to, in a sense, process it is to do it. And once you do it, you feel so much better. It's funny how you carry all that around of, can I just walk around? Can I ghost them? Can I block their phone calls? And when you finally figure out that you can't, you get to whatever it is that's going to be healing. But it, it's really, it is what I call the merry-go-round effect in the universe. 
we've all been on merry-go-rounds. As a kid, you, you soon discover that it is the least desirable ride at the amusement park. <laughs> don't you? And at first, it seems like it's going to be great, don't you? All right, that looks great. Look at all the painted horses and the elephants and this, and, the, and it's going up and down, and it's all this music, and all that. it's wonderful. And you get on it, and you realize you're not really going anywhere. It's just a bunch of noise and eye candy, basically, but you're not going anywhere. And I think this is how this universe works, that we think that we're making our quick escapes, but it keeps coming around again. Now, it, may, it comes around dressed up differently through different people, through different people we might marry or date, but it usually often is the same exact thing. And it brings you again to that breaking point where you think, ah, it's time for a do-over. Let's get out of here. But you, if you've done it enough times, you think, okay, well, that didn't work the last 10 times. <laughs> didn't even work the last 20 times. Maybe I should stop the merry-go-round and do something else. And that's the, the place that I think we often get to. We are at a world right now, like, can't we just run away from this stuff? And the answer is no. So it's interesting how we, how we try to run away from things. And we have, again, the merry-go-round effect, how it, it just keeps reoccurring and keeps happening and again until we have kind of the, the conscience of mind to say, okay, I've been here before. And so, in these do-overs, I, I found they, they usually come in, in three varieties. Um, do-overs in people, in money, and in time. Let me just point you, people, money, and time. So people, of course, we're really familiar with that. We've talked about this already. If this group of people or person would only be gone, it would be amazing. Now, this has shown up in so many movies, it's crazy. It's like the little theme from the Noah Ark keeps coming back. So, so I f was thinking, what is my favorite, if only that person didn't exist, movie or show? So my favorite one now is Lost in Space. Now, there's two Lost in Spaces. You know, there's this, the, mo the series from the s 60s, which I loved as a kid, and I've rewatched and was almost embarrassed that I liked it because it was so bad. <laughs> No, it's really bad. Um, take my word for it. it. It's really bad. I don't know why my brother and sister and I just were like over the moon for this thing. But Netflix has a new Lost in Space, which is really good. And so there were two seasons. You can go now, you know, go have brunch and go watch them today. And then we're on our edge of our seat waiting for the third and final season. And I love that it's final because they're not going to like in the 60s show leave them like out there forever never knowing what happened to them. But anyway, so here's the thing. So again, it's like, let's have a do-over. So in the new Lost in Space, we have made a mess of the Earth. Just made a mess. Nobody can breathe anymore. Nothing will grow. So let's go to Utopia. Let's make spaceships and go to a new planet and make a mess over there. Uh, but it's a whole fleet of, like, you know, great ships, and they're going to go, and it's, you know, people were jockeying to be chosen to go on here and, and go to this new place. But sometimes people get on the ship or the ark that aren't supposed to be there. And in this case, it is the evil Dr. Smith. <laughs> Remember? Now, in the 60s TV show, Dr. Smith was just kind of a, a bubbling saboteur that was somewhat harmless and kind of stumbled into the whole thing. But in the, t in the Netflix thing, it's a sociopath. And you're really kind of scared of her. And you, you, you don't want to be with Dr. Smith. But it's just like, we're going to Utopia and... <gasps> Who let Dr. Smith on the, uh, on the spaceship? She's wrecking everything. And she did. And we now we're at this planet instead of the good planet. And, and the robot was good, but now the robot's bad. And, just, and it's all her fault. What are we going to do with her? I guess we're going to find out in the third season. It's supposed to come out in the next couple months. I'll let you know if you don't watch it in your own. Uh, but still, this plot harnesses this idea of, again, the fly in the ointment. If we just jettison Dr. Smith off of Jupiter 2, wouldn't it be better? I mean, I, the audience thinks so. Yeah, yeah, get rid of Dr. Smith. Um, but I assure you that they would recreate Dr. Smith in some form 
if they did say, you know, get in the thing, you're going out here, we're going to shoot you to the moon, literally, um, kind of thing. So we have to look at that. Who is your Dr. Smith in your life right now, even small or big? Who, is there a recurring Dr. Smith? Meaning, any time you are employed, the person who employs you is Dr. Smith. Oh my God, this terrible person in different bodies. It must be a science fiction movie where they put on a new face and like, here they are again. The same problems, the same way that I feel this terrible thing when I go to my workplace. Dr. Smith is there. It could be any other part of your life. You may always live next door to Dr. Smith. You may always be marrying Dr. Smith or dating Dr. Smith. And we think again, if we were just jettisoned to the moon, things would be so much better. It's not that easy. So we bring that again to our first. First thing is people. Second thing is around money. Our biggest unhealed issues in the United States is around money. We don't want to talk about it because it's too secret. You know, I've shared this many, many, many times before. I had this, like, this eye-opening event when I was 19. When I, I went to cosmetology school and became a hairdresser. And I found out that me, at 19, that women of much older than me would tell me things I didn't want to know. <laughs> like what they did. And you know, I, didn't, I don't want to know this. But I found out that somehow, if I brought the conversation around to money or even their money, oh my God, that's too personal. We can't talk about that. Let's talk about my date last night. And, it was like, and I remember it was just this weird thing at 19. We don't talk about money. It's super secret. You just don't. And in our not talking about it, we make it also Dr. Smith. We don't develop as good of habits around it because we don't talk about it. Growing up in my, in my family, again, in, in the Catholic Church, I found out years later that my parents were really great donors of our church. But what I saw is every Sunday they put $2 in the basket. We can run this building that seats 1,000 people if everybody gives $2. But again, we ha they should have, because we don't talk about it, they should have brought me aside and said, you know, we put a little money there, but we feel invested in the spiritual community, and we, we do this on the side, and you know, to teach us, but, but we didn't. And anything, other weird ideas that I, I grew up about with money, because nobody would talk about it. So we make it the ultimate Dr. Smith. And we wonder, and again, we just think, our fantasy of do-over is, if I just had more, it would be better. Now, in some cases, that really is true. But if you're not handling it well, if your ideas about it, if you've made it this weird, evil Dr. Smith sort of thing, it doesn't matter how many zeros are there, you're still going to make a mess. Guaranteed. So part of our do-over in anything is to open up and to learn. Hard to learn when you won't, don't want to talk about something. Oh, no, 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 I can't talk about it. No, 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 blah, 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 <laughs> you know, can't, sort of thing. But we still make it a Dr. Smith. And still, as a country, we need great healing in that area because we won't talk about it. Then, of course, the, the third one is the um, Dr. Smith of time. Once I clear my calendar, I will be the best friend to my friends and my family. And it's going to happen someday. I have this big project, and it's going to be done in two weeks. And once it's done, guess what? We're, we're all going to Disneyland <laughs> or, or something like that. And we have these fantasies of what we're going to do when, when our, our, our time opens up. And even, I remember, as I've, I've told people before, my last job in Los, the Los Angeles area, I was uh, driving to and from work two to three hours a day, and I would have this fantasy. What would my life be like if I had that time? Of course, I found out, and it actually is pretty good. But... The thing is, is that when we make it a Dr. Smith, we empty out our time, and before you know it, as they say, the universe abhors a vacuum, like, whew, another project comes in. Oh, you know, I was gonna, we were going to go to Disneyland, but this great opportunity came here, and I only have to work 80 hours a week for a couple months now. 
And then, well, you know, ta- you know, then anything, sky's the limit after that, after I finish that. But in any of these areas, now, but to know that sometimes there are people that you're best to withdraw from, that sometimes, especially if you're making minimum wage, more money would work out better for you. And we all have times where I, uh, that our time is in balance, that we have certain things that happen, and I call it planned in balance, but things can even out. So I'm not talking about when those things happen because life happens like that. It's when they become habitual, when they become how things always seem to work out for us, when there is the merry-go-round effect that it seems to always be the case even when we think we are working towards it not. So that's the thing for us to look at. When is it a pattern? Not when it's like, yeah, things just happen. That's just life. We, we can't control everything that happens. But again, how is it? Let's look at the pattern. So when we do that, though, and we think, yeah, and I want to create something differently, something different. In the science of mind philosophy, we talk about the creative process a, lo- a lot, that as we change our beliefs and our thoughts, that we can change the course of our lives in very, very dramatic ways. Again, not that you can micromanage your experience, but you can really change course quite a bit. But I think where we have challenges in that is that when we want to change the course, we concentrate on so much of what we have to get rid of that we don't think of how great it would be if there was just something, a healed experience. So if we're always thinking of, yes, my, my perfect life would be without those people or just with more money or just with more time without really looking at the patterns, that's where, again, the creative process, we recreate. So I had a great insight th- this week uh, on YouTube. YouTube is great if you look at the right YouTubes. Now, actually, it, it can be a big, like, descent into nothingness of just crazy stuff. Plenty of crazy stuff. You could spend all day on crazy stuff on YouTube. But there's some really great things if you look around. There's some great teachers. And I found this, this, this guy that gives these, like, five-minute um, kind of lessons, let's call them, and just uh, metaphysical, spiritual lessons. And he was talking about the same words that we use here, the creative process and how it could work out better for you than it, than it might be right now. He also talked about how in the creative process we have a tendency to, to concentrate on that which we don't want. So like, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. You're going to get that. You get, you know, it's like, no, I don't want you. you know, you're going to get it. Have you ever like, you know, found a, a puppy in the street? Don't follow me, whatever you do. You know. <laughs> the puppy's going to follow you. Um, <laughs> And I like the way he said this. He says, look at the creative process is that, in that you are opening your heart and creating out of love. Just like that. That you are opening your heart to create out of love. Now let's go back to the bad person, the bad money, the bad time. When we are in that mode... I don't think we are in the, the mode of creating out of love. It's more, more just like the Noah Ark syndrome. Get rid of it. Put it over there. Let it go someone else's house. And an analogy, I thought, of this, I mean, just think of anything you may have created with true love in your life. I mean, anything from a business to a household, and think how wonderful that turned out compared to something that was created out of, I just got to get rid of the bad stuff. And I I think a great example, even though I'm not a parent, would be how many people bring, how some people or often people bring children in the world, whether the old-fashioned way or adopting. You prepare the way. You dream about the opportunities that you can help this child have. You prepare the room, and you give so much thought, I mean, to every piece of furniture and, and wall covering and fabric that's in that room, because you just want it to be a place that welcomes that child when they come home f- 
for the first time. And think of it. And I know that many of you are parents, and you did that to some degree, didn't you? Especially with the first one. After the first one, it was like, <laughs> this, is, this is not an idealized situation. They come in as a person, and you don't know what you're getting. But at first, it's just like you're welcoming this amazing person into the world. And so just think of that, whether you have kids or not. I don't have kids. Of just that consciousness, that feel of, I am making the way for something amazing. When you are thinking about creating or welcoming something amazing, you can't energetically think about the stuff you don't want to have. I mean, think about it. If you really are on that energy of welcoming something into your life with love, you're in a completely different energetic than get rid of the person, the money weird thing, and the time. When you're thinking of just welcoming something with love, it's just you would do anything, in a sense, to make that road nicer, more loving, more inviting. And so look at anything that you would like to invite in the world, and us as, as a human people of what we would like to see in the world right now. And it's so easy to get into, there's so much stuff we need to get rid of. You know, where's Noah when you need him kind of thing. And just think, as exasperating as things are in the world today, how can we each do our part to set a different tone? And knowing it's not going to be idealized or perfect. And on the same vein, I, there was this great commercial during the Paralympics a few weeks ago that was on the, on the same theme. You remember the Paralympics are right after the, the I, I don't know, regular Olympics um, for people who have some sort of physical disability. And this commercial, I don't even remember what it was, if it was trying to advertise anything, but it was recreating, it was talking about this one young woman who was a swimmer um, who does, doesn't have legs, and it was cr recreating the moment, again, it was dramatize of her parents when she was adopted, when her parents found out that they were going to get her as a child. And, and it, it was so, I, I, I knew it was, again, it was a drama commercial, but it made me tear up every time. So you probably saw it. So it was very artfully done, and you kind of saw the young woman swimming, and kind of her parents in a vignette over her future parents, and her getting the call for the first time. They were living in the United States, I believe, from s Russia or somewhere in that part of the world, that they finally had a child for them to adopt. And you could see in this actress, she was great. And it was just like, oh, well, you know, our dream is coming true. And then the person on the other phone, side of the phone said, but it's not going to be easy. She has a physical condition, and we're having to amputate her legs. It's not going to be easy. And again, this actress was great, because in all of like two seconds of silence, you could see any number of things go through her brain of the options of what it was going to be like. And then she just said, we can't wait to meet her. And so that is the essence of paving the way with love and knowing it may not be easy. It's not going to be the way that I looked. I, I want it to look. Dr. Smith may still show up. But it's still up to me of, of how this turns out, at least with the true intention that I want to launch this new endeavor. So I think that's the key. So I just want to close today by a little something I found by written by Todd Michael from the book The Twelve Conditions of a Miracle. Just really short. It says, how do you feel about others who appear around you as you travel through your life? If you seriously intend to see your dream become reality, then you will need to intentionally cultivate automatic reflexes of genuine compassion. You will have to change your attitudes and reactions, however subtle, from judgment and condemnation to selfless compassion and love if you hope to manifest a miracle. Think of it this way. Although it may sound odd, selflessness is in your own self-interest. When you begin to put the welfare of others ahead of your own, your own dreams will begin to advance 
with incredible efficiency. So let's just take the essence of this and go within for a moment. Let's put aside what we think is wrong right now. There's so many things that we'd like to see different, but let's put that over here for a bit. And imagine what would it be like within my consciousness, your consciousness, our collective consciousness, to pave the way to a new way of being with love. What does that feel like? What does that look like? What does that feel and look like when we just don't feel like doing it? What does it feel like when someone or something presents itself that we just want to go away? How do we still pave the way for love? As a first step, we allow ourselves to be open to that possibility, to commit to that possibility, and to allow a greater unfoldment than we as humans at the moment can even begin to realize. And in this, we simply just give thanks. It's an unknown in a sense, but we still give thanks. And in our thanksgiving, we simply let it go. We let spirit figure this out and know that we are here to show up anyway. And so it is.